and welcome to Translating Romania, our special event celebrating some of the brightest translators that gave Romanian literature an international voice. My name is Gabriela Mocan, and I'm the creative producer and co-curator of Romania Rocks, the first ever festival of Romanian-British literature organized jointly by the Romanian Cultural Institute in London with support from the European Literature Network in the UK, featuring a stellar lineup of authors and translators and a wide variety of events over these four weeks. All of our events are free and easy to access thanks to London Video Stories. All the books can be purchased through our partner bookshops and all the festival details can be found on our two websites. Today's conversation followed by a special event on the 11th of November featuring award-winning translators Sean Cotter and Philip Byrne is kindly supported by the British Centre for Literary Translation. It gives me great pleasure to welcome our long-term collaborator and friend, Duncan Large, Professor of European Literature and Translation at University of East Anglia and Academic Director of the British Centre for Literary Translation to address a few words of welcome to our guests today. Duncan, the Zoom floor is yours. Many thanks, Gabriella. It's so nice to be working with you again. Uh, as Gabriella was saying, I work at the British Centre for Literary Translation, which is at the University of East Anglia in Norwich. BCLT was founded just over 30 years ago in 1989 by my predecessor as Professor of European Literature, the renowned German writer W.G. Max Seebald, who was looking to emulate the European Translators College in Stalin, Germany, as a place to receive translators in residence working on translation projects. That's still an important part of what we do, although in the age of COVID, our residencies have, of course, had to move online along with the rest of our program. And since our foundation, we've also expanded our role in a number of ways. Our primary role now is as a research center at UEA, and in that context, we run an online research seminar in literary translation, which is open to all. We engage in translation related research projects and host book launches and larger events. Supported by Arts Council England in partnership with the National Centre for Writing, also in Norwich, we run a, a varied public program to support the development of literary translation as a profession in the UK and beyond, including an annual Zebalt lecture on literary translation a summer school in literary translation and creative writing, and in collaboration with a number of European partners, an annual European school in literary translation. So collaboration with international partners has always been a mainstay of our program. And I'm very pleased to say this is not the first time that we've worked with Romanian translators. Four years ago, in the Shakespeare year of 2016, we worked with the British Council on a series of Shakespeare translation seminars across the world. And I had the pleasure of participating in the first, held in Cologne in Germany, with three parallel groups working to translate a selection of short Shakespeare texts from English into, respectively, German, Polish and Romanian. The Romanian group was led by the distinguished translator and academic George Volchenov, and with the assistance of Gabriela and the Romanian Cultural Institute in London, I was able then to bring George over to Norwich later that year to participate in a symposium on Shakespeare in translation. So we're looking forward to collaborating on further Romanian projects in future. And I'm delighted that BCLT could be part of this wonderful cultural festival, and especially this celebration of Romanian literature in translation today. Congratulations to Rosie Boy uh, and colleagues on a fascinating edition of the Romanian Riveter. And congratulations to Magda, to Gabriela and Rosie on assembling such a stellar array of talent for this afternoon's mouthwatering event. 
I don't want to hold up proceedings any further then, except to say thank you to the organizers for inviting BCLT to be involved and welcome all to a literary feast translating Romania. Thank you very much, Duncan, for being with us today and for all the support you and the British Centre for Literary Translation has given to us. Uh, now, um, I'm thinking of uh, America's groundbreaking writer and critic, George Steiner, who used to say that without translation, we would be living in provinces bordering on silence. These are words that I fully endorse. And because I believe that silence can be good, but still in moderation, I'm extremely happy to introduce you to my star guests for today. Josefina Comporali, Diana Manole, Philip O'Kelly, Gabi Reich, Andrea Scridon, Adam Sorkin, and Lydia Viano in alphabetical order. Our fabulous group should have been completed by Alistair Jan Blythe, the man to whom Romanian literature and Romania owes an impressive number of translated books. I can assure you that his absence today is only on camera, for I'm sure that he must be translating something even now while we're talking. Unfortunately, he could not be with us due to a very nagging cold. But let me now turn to my Zoom living room guests who got here from Romania, the UK, America, and Canada. Welcome, everyone. It's a great joy to be together with all of you again. And thank you for joining our Romania Rocks Club. I must say that all of you are wearing quite a few hats. And it would be unjust of me to simply label you as translators. This would definitely not do you justice. So I will start in no particular order with Lydia Viano, who is also a writer, critic, and professor of contemporary British literature at the University of Bucharest, as well as the director of Contemporary Literature Press. Lydia published extensively, her translations to date counting no fewer than 40 books, and we had the pleasure of working together on the recent Romanian Rivata magazine published uh, by the European Literature Network in the UK with funding from Timish Council in Romania. Welcome, Lydia. Thank you for being with us today. And my first question for you would be, could you please tell us a little bit more about the aims and the origins of the publishing house that you are running? It all started with uh, my being able to organize the MA program and the students needed practice. And some of the practice is editing and book writing. So I thought, why not a publishing house? So I began it under the University of Bucharest, of course. And then, of course, you came along as the first important patron we could have. And then the Writers' Union. And uh, finally, uh, I thought this is not just the publishing house of books to be read, since it's for the students, it should be a publishing house that helps the teaching of English via its literature. So that's how we began, and our specific is publishing bilingually. So we publish the English and the Romanian version, either English books translated or Romanian books translated. And we have quite an impressive uh, number of books by now, uh, almost 500. And uh, they are very, very well accessed. I, I'm very happy to see. Uh, we mean to go on and we mean to make a larger team because right now it's been me and me and me. But uh, we, we really mean to, to have a team. And probably one of the best achievements of this publishing house is an extraordinary uh, manual, which only those who have read Finnegan's Way can understand in 130 volumes. It's a manual of Finnegan's Way, which practically brings together everything that has been written about Finnegan's Way and uh, a, a linearized text of Finnegan's Way because with Higgins Wake, you can't change a letter 
from the original print. So uh, if we are known for anything, practically this is the main thing that we are known for, the 130 volume handbook of Finnegan Strait, which was initiated and coordinated by uh, uh, my former colleague, Professor George Sandulescu, who was one, who was a, a very well-known Georgian himself. You are also running a master's program in translation uh, with um, so many students. I was impressed uh, of the number of students uh, that are actually attending your, your course. And I wanted to ask you, which are the skills that these students uh, mostly acquire on this course? Uh, this is a painful case. That is, we are teaching uh, a job that no longer brings the possibility to make a living. So of course our hobby and, and our passion will always be translating literature. But we have to give these students some way of making a living. And if I don't want to push them in the arms of the multinational, international, and so on, uh, firms that will give them a lot of money, take away their day, and eventually disappear, leaving them with no job, you, I have to be inventive. So on the one hand, we teach them English. Basically, they have to know English. And we do that choosing to teach English via a literary text, because that is a very correct and rich vocabulary. Second, we teach them how to edit a book, which comes in handy. Some of our students, I think, managed to get a job in England on the basis of what they did, the CV they uh, managed to acquire during the, the MA program. So they learn how to edit, how to confront, how to proofread. Uh, so they, they learn everything we can give them about how to make a book, what books to choose. Uh, they teach us what books to choose because reading changes from generation to generation. But on the other hand, we try to help them translate other kinds of cultural texts. So it's not just literary. They translate, for instance, the site of uh, uh, Radio Romania, mu uh, classical musical Romanian station, one of the best in Europe, and uh, their site in English is translated exclusively by our students. We are very happy to do that. Uh, of course, everything that goes on with us is non-profit the publishing house, everything we translate. It's uh, voluntary and, uh, and, and students do volunteer. And I'm trying to, to catch at every opportunity that can push them in, uh, in the direction of a, of a decent job. So I invite anybody I can and I try to publish them. This year we published a book about uh, the, corona, the C virus, I called it because I, I hate the name COVID and coronavirus. So we talked about the C virus homework and they, uh, we have such a big book uh, published on paper by, one, by uh, a temporary uh, editor and they wrote it. It is their... Uh, diary during the first months when we hoped it would go away very soon. And the second uh, book of the same kind will be Life on Zoom, as I told Mihai. Wonderful title. And if he, he allows me, I'm going to use it and I'll send you the book. I think your students are extremely lucky to have a professor and mentor like you, Lydia. Um, Thank you. And it would be lovely to hear now uh, a fragment uh, of your translated work. Um, what are you going to share with us today? Uh, it's a book that is still looking for a publisher, hopefully in England. I'm not sure we managed to, we'll manage to do that. In Romanian, I can, I can publish it. But this is such a good poet that it's worth being published in English for an English eye. I've chosen, uh, his name is Robert Sherban from Timisoara. Uh, I've chosen very short poems so that they won't be difficult to follow. One of them says, I am being watched. All of a sudden, 
I sense I'm being watched. I hold. I look around and up. An ant walks away from under my soul and goes on about its business. Scales. I'm a set of scales whose plates are no longer connected to each other. Broken glass. Have you ever broken a bottle? Have you picked up the broken glass? Have you cut your fingers? Well, friends are like broken glass. Even though they make your hands bleed, you continue to pick them up. Mirror. The sky is always beautiful because the sky is the mirror in which we never see ourselves, however hard we might stare. And the last one, Carmine bag. You find a woman's bag on the pavement. Elegant, small, Carmine red. And the last thing that comes to mind when you open it is money. Thank you. Very welcome. Before I go on, I would like to say that everybody who is watching this now is welcome to address any questions or comments. Please do so in uh, the box you have uh, in the event. And if we have a chance at the end, uh, we are going to answer them, address them. Uh, if not, we promise that uh, we will all get back to you with our individual answers. So I will now continue with Adam Sorkin. I remember meeting Adam in London in 2016 when we launched the all Romanian issue of Poem Magazine, edited and run by poet Fiona Sampson, one of the greatest friends of Romanian poetry and literature in England. Uh, this magazine uh, contained and contains uh, poems beautifully translated by Adam. It was a joy to meet him then as well as today. Uh, Adam is also a distinguished professor of English emeritus at Penn State Brandywine and has 65 books of Romanian translation in print and accepted for publication this year. I wish they were all in print. Adam, since I have this opportunity now, ask you something that I, I believe uh, everybody would be interested uh, to know. Uh, what first inspired you to translate Romanian literature? That's a story I've told a number of times in, in the spring of 1981. Someone came to my office. I was a Fulbright lecturer at the University of Bucharest. This is Irina Pana, who's back in Romania after being in Australia for a while. Uh, came and said she had this translation of the Timisoara poet, Angel Dumbravianu, and um, it's, she wanted me to go over it. I did, and I made some corrections, made some changes, and I got, as it were, hooked on translation. I found it much more interesting, much more rewarding, much more creative, um, than writing another article on something that already has five or 10 or 15 articles on it. The only difference now is you use a new, I'm, I'm cynical about this, a new th critical theoretical apparatus. So it, it really changed my career entire, entirely. Com coming as a Fulbrighter to Romania, I was supposed to be presenting in some ways the ideas of American propaganda, but instead I was the one who was changed and I, worked since then collaboratively as I, as I did from that first time because we went over it in the office over and again and again and again. Um, and I've worked with Lydia, I've worked with Diana, I've worked with Andrea. Um, I'm, I think, you know, you say I've done the translation, but I think that we, it's always we, and I always give full credit to my co-translator, but I've, I've continued to do it. I, you know, it keeps me off the streets. It's, so, I'm, so really, since 1981, I've said this before, I'm a 39-year-old translator. 
That's amazing. And I, I believe that after this event today, you will most probably work with uh, Gabi, Josefina and Philip as well. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> what can you tell us about this collaborative experience in translating? <sighs> it's, it's, a, it's been very interesting in, in a lot of different ways. Um, so for some people, I've worked with um, fellow translators, you know, scholars, and with poets themselves, um, including some very you know, important names. I'm not gonna go through a list, this is silly. Um, but at times, most interestingly, the ones who give me the most freedom are often the writers. If they know English, um, they, they know the differences in the way English sounds, the requirements of English to have um, pronouns that are gendered. To requ the requirement of English to have pronouns. A number of times our poets have said, do you have to use he or she? Well, yes, you can't just not do it. Uh, there have been other very small things and much larger things. Um, I've had people say big arguments with somebody whom I um, know very well and we've worked it out. You're ruining my poem. I think the, def the argument was about the use of definite versus indefinite articles which is different between the two languages. Uh, it, it's, it's a very, you know, and other times um, I've had poets change their poems. I don't like this anymore. Why don't you use this phrasing? Uh, on the other hand, working with, with um, uh, people who aren't the writers, I, you know, it's a very rich experience. It's kind of a friendship. It's a kind of collaborative um, social activity at the same time as, um, translating a third party poet or poet, you know, I, I don't use poetess. I know a lot of Romanians translate that word. That is not a good word in English. Uh, it's a put down. Um, it's been um, absolutely interested in what I'm doing. And I, you know, I've always taught American literature and Ameri more prose than poetry, but this is like the other side of my and now that I'm retired, it's, it is what I do. I will actually look back on one of your collaborative experiences now with Diana Manole, who is uh, also here with us today, mm -hmm. and refer to um, a very happy moment in 2018 when you and Diana got the second prize in the John Dryden translation competition for your translation of Emilian Galai Coupon's poetry. That was uh, a really wonderful uh, moment. Sadly, uh, neither of you was able to travel to London for that. And um, I was uh, the happy messenger uh, who, who took that uh, prize um, for you from uh, Dr. Richard uh, Hibbit of the University of Leeds. Um, are you going to delight us with some of these poems today or have you prepared uh, something else? No, I thought I, actually it's going to be, it's a complex, when you deal with Emilian, it's always a complex poem. Let's, let's, um, the, the earlier ones are short, um, very often poems of sex, love, and um, some degree of iron, ironic politics um, when he could. The later poems are much more complex. This is not one of the ones that was in the prize um, group that we sent, but I'd like to read a more recent poem. We've done a book called Canting Arms. Canting, is, I've seen it misprinted. Canting is a heraldic term that um, when, you, when you have um, heraldic symbols and they're puns, they're called canting arms or you know, coat of arms. Um, this is, he sent it after we had translated, it was from two previous books of his two, two collections. It's called Brother Emil. If I may, it's, it's gonna be a little long, but let me, let me give it a try. There are two references, probably all of you know them. Uh, Rebriano, Livio Rebriano, his brother Emil was hanged in 1917 by the Austro-Hungarians when he was caught crossing the border. And the other is Ivanescu, Mercia Ivanescu, his brother um, committed suicide. If you don't have a hanged brother, Emil, like Rebriano, it's useless to try to write prose. 
Better than a plumb bomb on, bob on a string is the brother's noose for a boost in precision. A grandfather clock requires winding, yet it still falls behind now and then. For while brother Emil, the cuckoo clock struck right at the hour, especially if you write a novel, there's no way you can do without a brother Emil swinging from the gallows for high treason. All the higher as his brother's deed, not to shoot those of his own blood is more debasing. There's no replacement for a brother Emil, no matter how many classes of lieutenants graduate from military schools from this day on. If, you're a if you've a brother, you've a book. The history of Romanian literature bears witness. As many dear spirits hang around, that's how many kibitzers you play in your brother's name, the hangman card, and the writing desk frolics under your elbows, just like the stool under Brother Emil's feet, a world in suspense. No one should dare sit at the writing table, dissection table, wake table, it's all the same, who doesn't have a Brother Emil, a suicide like Ivanescu's. One day later than he decided to, because that evening he couldn't miss a concert. Poetry is someone else, a being departed before its time who gets continued in the lines of those who remain in their own image, growing together. That might be a good definition of translation too. Um, from the other, not from himself, the poet sets forth. The same as with the serial suicide through predecessors. If God hasn't given you a brother, Emil, don't let poetry cross your mind. Better than the silencer installed on the gun barrel is this young temple when it pushes you towards writing cerebral poems. And what a relief that the hand that writes isn't what must place the full stop, pulling the trigger. All your life, you feel guilty about that. Even if you have no guilt, ends up usurping the role of self-consciousness. A name predestined to fit you like a glove. Don't confuse their hands. The hanged man and the suicides. Take the hand of one, then the other. Don't confuse their names. Brother Emil, the first as much lacking as the second one's absent and who scheduled a meeting on your chest like two post-mortem medals. I'm sorry, post-mortem medals in the rank of knight of the sorrowful countenance. An officer of the reserves, you play orderly now to one, line up, then to the other, at ease. The same eternal lieutenant. It's simply that there's no one, unless you're your own brother Emil to yourself, to take his place. Let yourself be written by brother Emil in absentia before brother Emil gives up writing only so that the, in the end, even you can make good, bad, a name for yourself. Now in the first person, I'm brother Emil, the hanged man and the suicide of tomorrow playing games. I lost my life at cards, at reading cards, at writing cards, my life. Names are all as if from the dead, given gratuitously when there's no one to call you, Moan M, and that M is E-M. Thank you, Adam. Um, quite a dramatic moment uh, there. And uh, I'll continue with... Um, Jose Sorry, that was a little bit long. I apologize, you know. But... No, 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 that was uh, really, really nice and, and welcome. You kind of passed the ball to me, and uh, in this case, uh, given the, the drama in, in the translation, I'll continue with uh, a translator who works on uh, dramatic texts, uh, Josefina Comporali. Um, Josefina lectures at the University of the Arts London. She translates from Romanian and Hungarian into English and has authored numerous publications on theater. I remember meeting her in 2015 when RCI London launched Matej Mishniak's first anthology in English entitled How to Explain the History of Communism to Mental Patients and Other Plays, which Josefina herself has translated. 
Welcome, Josefina. And uh, I have the first question for you would be, how did you actually start translating drama? Thank you for the invitation, Gabriela. Well, how did I translate drama? Uh, by, by chance, really. So as, as you yourself pointed out, I'm an academic and I've been working as a theatre academic for almost 20 years now in a UK context. And I did a PhD in, in, in drama. And uh, my initial aim was just, just to teach and possibly uh, write academic texts. But then over the years, I, I kind of got somewhat annoyed by the lack of diversity in sort of dramatic literature that is being taught. And I felt that there was a need for more current texts coming from a broader range of countries that our students could draw on through their studies. And this is how I, I ended up turning to the work of Matej Vishniak that I have been familiar with for a long time. And in fact, in the early days, I wasn't necessarily thinking of translating myself. I was thinking of, to an extent, promoting the work of other translators. And actually, in this anthology that you kindly mentioned, I've included translations by other translators who have started this work prior to me. So I always thought about this as, as, a, as a sort of work of cultural ambassador ambassadorialism, if you like, of, of, of the cultural exchange, of drawing on existing translations and, of course, keeping up with the incredibly prolific work of the playwright and then generating, of course, new translations um, as, as, as we go along. So since then, I've been working on more recent texts by Matei as well and then hoping to, to put them out there and persuade also as much as possible theater companies to put them on. So in addition to the published text, we also have uh, staged versions as much as, as indeed possible in the circumstances. How is translating drama different from translating other literary genres? Well, it has a different dimension. Um, in the case of Matej Vishnek, but also other playwrights, there is certainly a very strong literary element. And as, as we've seen, they do get published. So they work as texts and, and they're part of drama, which is, of course, a genre of literature. But also um, drama ideally is being staged and put on by theatre companies and are watched by audiences, in which case uh, we, we want an open text that can respond to the directorial vision of a given company and it is also manageable in terms of speakability and performability so the actors the performers can actually say those words they can breathe as it were whilst trying to pronounce sometimes very kind of complex uh, words so bearing in mind this duality i think is 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 really important and another thing that i really love about our drama translation that it's never ever complete because should we be lucky that a particular text is staged on over and over again in time it gets changed because it resonates with again with the directorial concepts with the moment and time when the play is put on so it is never really complete there's always a change there's always an alteration there's always a negotiation so hopefully the text stays live and fresh I was wondering now, uh, while you're translating, and especially when you have the, the, the end result, uh, to, call, to put it that way, uh, if you ever perform your own translations. And I will invite you now to actually read uh, a fragment. Um, I presume it's going to be probably another fragment from Matej Wisniak's text, or maybe Andra Shvitsky, whom you've also translated. Well, I wouldn't say I perform them. I'm occasionally reading them and I'm trying, of course, to not make it totally flat. But I've never really been an actor myself, apart from my kind of early days when I was a student. So I, I, I much prefer it if, if professional actors read these texts or indeed the playwrights themselves, who we have seen at the recent launch of The Riveter, can work really well, where Matej Wisniak read his own uh, an extract. But yes, um, I'm trying as I work 
to hear the text very much and I read it out loud myself. I use my family quite extensively in reading our text and I'm lucky enough to work with performers and indeed students in the workshopping pr uh, process. So a lot of time is being spent on hearing how a particular solution might sound in English and I go through many, many drafts until I, I reach a version which, as I said earlier, is never final, but it is, you know, ready to be shared. Let's put it that way. And what I've chosen for today is work in progress. It is indeed by Matej Vishnye, um, because I just felt that I, I could not choose anybody else for this particular situation. And also because I'm working on this text and I'm hoping to have it published. Uh, I do not have a theatre company uh, lined up for this yet, but I have read this extract with uh, a number of other people with whom I regularly workshop theatre translation. So it has been tested a bit, but as I say, it is not finished and it hasn't been published yet, so it's kind of new. So uh, if, um, if you like, I can turn to it. It's about five minutes long, so hopefully we have that much time uh, in this uh, particular situation. So um, it is an extract from a play uh, called The Man Who Had All His Malice Removed by Matej Vishniak that he's written uh, in Romanian as well as in French, as he often does. He writes versions of his plays in both these languages. I tend to translate from the Romanian, I should say, but I often uh, read the French and, and might, might take uh, solutions from that into account as well. This is a scene about, uh, let's say, uh, halfway through the play, and it's a monologue of sorts. I've chosen it to not to have to do too many voices. It focuses on a character called Eric, who is a celebrity journalist. And the play deals to a great extent with the influence of media on our lives and with, with, with kind of globalization occasionally going wrong. Uh, the title of the scene is Journalism Without Hypocrisy, Lesson Two. Eric, rules in a number of bizarre gadgets, smilometers, used to measure various degrees and types of smile. He demonstrates a smile. Look, my eyes feel slightly moist, my face relaxed, my mouth half open and curved up. To mark the beginning of the 10 o'clock news, I have 10 different facial expressions to choose from. He points to the 10 smilometers displayed on trolleys. They look like devices used to test eye vision, but also like miniature guillotines. 10 actors place their chins on their respective smilometers. Moving from one to the other, Eric sets their respective smile levels. This is a smilometer invented by myself with which I can select the relevant smile for each occasion. With this device, I can set the expression that corresponds to the first two or three news items of the day, or even the entire news bulletin. Level zero is an almost audible laugh. I use it on festive occasions for New Year or Christmas, or when our country wins the World Cup, or when it attracts global attention for some amazing achievement. It is absolutely essential that no catastrophe or murder attempt should disrupt such a day. He models the expression corresponding to level zero. Level one is a massive smile, a complice, even witty. He resets the expression on the actor's face to make it correspond to level one. Level two is a calm and soothing smile, a sort of slide through which words flow straight into the listener's ears. The same procedure. He sets the relevant expression for level two. Level three is a formal flat smile, which doesn't give much away about the mood of the forthcoming half an hour. To put it differently, viewers can be prepared for pretty much anything. He sets the face attached to smilometer three to the relevant expression. Level four is a censored and repressed smile, as if it wanted to alert viewers. I'm a warm and open person, but what I have to tell you unfortunately forces me to adopt a somber tone. Fine tunes the face to reflect subtle details. Level five is just a shadow of a smile, 
a passing glimpse of old friends, meaning, oh, how I'd like to spend some time with you, but this breaking news won't allow me. The face in smilometer six might repeat, oh, how I'd like to spend some time with you, but this breaking news won't allow me. Level six is reserved for professional sobriety. The expression is still humane, but could barely be classed as considerate, as if I wanted to warn viewers, sorry, what you are about to hear isn't pleasant, but you have to learn about it regardless. Eric resets the expression. Level seven is an expression of controlled concern. It is the expression for announcing a plane crash, an earthquake, or perhaps a terror attack. Level seven conveys the message, let's keep calm and assess things together, responsibly and in dignity. Expression. Wand in hand, Eric remodels the face and adjusts the expression at the corner of the mouse. Level eight is almost a frown an expression of obvious refusal regarding the enormity of the forthcoming announcement. With this, I warn those who have just tuned in that I will talk about things I consider abhorring, events that repulse me, and that in addition to information I'm about to broadcast, I also invite my audience to join me in condemning these events. How is it possible that on an island in the Mediterranean, where thousands of people spend their dream holiday, the sea should bring to the shore the bodies of hundreds of African immigrants drowned while attempting to make it to Europe. Eric keeps adjusting the face in Expressometer 9 until the dead bodies of illegal immigrants can be glimpsed in reflection. Level 9 is the expression that corresponds to national mourning. It heralds disastrous news. It's a warning that after watching my broadcast, Nobody would be carry on with their usual activities, have dinner, watch film, or go to bed in peace. It's the expression I adopt whenever there's a nuclear explosion and radioactive clouds are heading towards us. I made use of this expression when the Chernobyl nuclear plant exploded back in April 1986. Eric sets the same expression on his own face as in the smilometer number 10. See? All done. Okay, uh, now let's continue, I suggest, with our second guest from the UK, uh, Gabi Rai. Gabi Rai, whom I met in 2019, when her translation of Lucien Blaga's poem of Light was launched in conjunction with Romania's participation at the London Book Fair. In 2017, she won the Stephen Spender Prize for Poetry in Translation, and in 2019, her translation of Mihail Sebastian's The Town with Akacha Trees won the first time, it was the first ever Romanian text that won the Pen Translates Award. Besides being a prolific translator, as you can tell by now, Gabi also teaches A-level English at a sixth form college in Hampshire. Welcome, Gabi. And um, I know you started a series entitled Interbellum Series. You, you translate uh, literature from, inter from the interwar period. Why, what made you do this? What made you want to, uh, to launch this series? Hi. Um, yeah, so uh, I mean, the main reason why I wanted to translate them uh, is because I like the books um, and because I think they're important. Um, so, you know, like Lydia was saying, um, translation's not exactly like a money spinner. So you might as well kind of translate the books that you like and you enjoy. Um, and uh, I also think uh, that, you know, there's something kind of quite surprising, you know, always when I read these books, there's something kind of surprisingly modern and I always feel like I'm um, discovering something new about that age and seeing kind of both contrasts and parallels to ours in terms of uh, um, how people lived, how people loved and, and so on. Uh, for example, you mentioned the town with acacia trees and, uh, you know, that, that was the first 
novel that I translated. And the thing that really grabbed me about that was the fact that it starts, the first chapter is called First Blood, and it's about um, a girl getting her first period. And, you know, I was really sort of surprised to see a book written by a male writer in the 1930s about something that's still kind of quite a taboo thing even now to write about. And other things that he writes about as well in that novel with a great deal of, you know, sensitivity and empathy, like a, a doomed uh, lesbian relationship. Uh, there's something, you know, I felt that I was discovering about that world and, uh, um, and, and that's why I enjoyed them. And um, about the question about it being important as well, um, you know, uh, Duncan mentioned uh, in the introduction about the project that they uh, did where they translated Shakespeare in lots of different countries. And uh, that made me think that, uh, you know, everybody around the world knows Shakespeare. Everybody around the world generally knows Jane Austen or Dickens. And, uh, you know, English has kind of got this kind of very dominant culture and people in Romania would have read all these books. Uh, but people haven't read the classics of uh, Romanian literature. Um, they have read the classics of other literatures. So, for example, um, before uh, reading the Romanian Riveter, I read the German Riveter, and there was in the editorial there, the editor had said that um, researching the German Riveter had given him the opportunity to find out about contemporary German literature. But before that, he'd been familiar with the classics of German literature. So, for example, Thomas Mann. And so there's certain kind of literatures like French, German, Italian, you know, that people feel like they ought to read read, you know, uh, you know, people feel like they've got to say that they've read, you know, Proust and Thomas Mann and Dante or whatever. But there's lots of other kind of literary heritages of other countries that are still kind of yet undiscovered. And, uh, and I think that's kind of a, a shame, really, because I think particularly like these books, you know, which are the, the ones that I'm translating, I'm seeing sort of as the canon, I guess, the, the books that are artistically accomplished, they've sort of lasted the test of time, you know, they're, they're really kind of, you know, good, valuable books. Um, and the roots of contemporary literature, like the poem, for example, that Adam read out, you know, that's got its roots in Red Briano, that's got its roots in UNESCO. Um, and so you need to kind of know what the roots are, I think, before you can properly understand, um, you know, a contemporary literature. Um, and, uh, and, and so, so, yeah, so kind of that's kind of the main reason, really. So, Are you thinking of translating um, anything else outside this particular historical period? Um, yes, I have. And uh, I've kind of, I tended to translate sort of uh, modern poetry and uh, essays and so on. I tend to want to find literature written by women because I'm uh, in the, you know, contemporary literature written by women. So I've translated Roxandra Cesariano, uh, some poetry and some essays and other ones too. And, um, but, um, uh, you know, because I'm, I'm aware that kind of, you know, the interwar period is fairly male dominated in terms of the men are translated. But I do also want to translate more women writers as well from that period to ones that are well known, like Hortensia Papada Benjesco, but ones that are like uh, less well known, uh, like Sorana Gurian, um, Bianca Cernat, uh, um, an academic in Romania, has written a really interesting book about interbellum women, women writers. And so that's kind of introduced me to lots of really interesting people that perhaps should sort of have their voices heard a bit more. Are you going to tell us to some um, interwar Romanian literature today? Yes, yes. Uh it's funny because there's a connection there to um, what Adam was talking about, Rebreanu. So it's a, from a Rebreanu novel, but it's not the one about the hanged brother. It's, a, it's another one, it's Chuliandra, um, written in 1927. And um, I, I translated this one after I translated the Mihail Sebastian novels and play. Um, and, uh, you know, I was kind of struck that even though it's kind of at a different at a different, um, uh, sorry, the similar sort of time period when they're written, um, they, they have very different styles. So um, to me, I think Sebastian is kind of, you know, this master of understatement and bathos, and I, I like that in his work. And but I think Rebriano is a bit more dramatic. So this book is like a psychological thriller almost. It's about um, a, um, 
uh, an aristocrat who murders his peasant born wife and then is sent by his father to an asylum uh, where, um, you know, hoping to sort of escape um, sort of punishment. And he tells the psychiatrist, who is also not all he seems, uh, he tells him um, this story about how he met his wife and how he murdered his wife. Um, so the bit I'm going to read is about the Chulianda, which is the dance where um, they uh, first met, he had first met his wife, and it's the dance that begins to obsess the main character um, and also um, becomes a sort of symbol for the complex relationship between the urban world and the rural world, that kind of sense of fascination and repulsion, I guess. So uh, I'll read that if that's okay. So just have some water for... Okay. So, anyway, I came back from the war a sub-lieutenant, like everyone else. I hadn't seen any action, of course, hadn't been anywhere near a battlefield. My father was very careful that I shouldn't become a hero. And then, as soon as I was out of uniform, he told me that he wanted to see me married straight away. Very well, then. Let him find me a wife and I would be ready. But before he could, he made a gesture with his hand. I don't know how he was planning to find a girl to my liking. I never asked him. Still, one Sunday, the old man decided that we would drive to my uncle's estate in Arjesh, Manesht, and spend around three days there. We were supposed to leave early so that we would get there at midday, but because my father had some unforeseen business to attend to, it was almost lunchtime before we left. We estimated we would arrive there at three. On account of the bad roads and our worn tires, my father has always been mean when it comes to spending money on the car. We had several minor breakdowns, so that it's already five by the time we decided to stop in a village at least an hour away from Manesh. We were running out of petrol and starving, and then we chanced upon this inn by the side of the road, a miserable place, just like the rest of the village. But what could we do? We stopped there to grab something to eat and for the chauffeur to refuel the car. The innkeeper, a very shady character, insisted on preparing us a banquet and suggested that we should go and watch the village dance, saying that there would be many beautiful girls there and that the dance would take place just in the backyard of the inn. Because we didn't seem keen, the innkeeper insisted. You must see the Chulandra, if nothing else. They don't dance it anywhere like we do here. Our fiddlers are the best. It's a fine thing to see. Yes, Chulandra, the doctor murmured very quietly, listening with a cold gleam in his eyes. Have you heard of this strange dance before? For you cut in immediately, surprised and delighted at the same time. Hmm, yes, the doctor replied, unexpectedly startled, immediately regretting that the words had escaped his mouth. There was a pause. For you smiled confusedly, waiting for the doctor to continue. Then, frustrated by his long silence, he resumed his story irritably. Well, yes, Chulandra. Anyway, the innkeeper led us to a veranda from which we could watch the dance as if from a box of the theatre. At first, perhaps because I was hungry, I didn't think it was anything special. It was a village gathering like any other. The girls were so-so, the lads even less impressive. Besides their, dancing, besides, their dancing was fairly ordinary, spiritless. And then the Chulandra began. Well, doctor, Anyone who hasn't watched the Chilandra could never understand how intoxicating it is, Puyo exclaimed fervently, his eyes burning with ecstasy. It starts just like any other dance, very slow, very restrained. The dancers gather, form a circle, choose their partners, guided by lust or maybe at random. Stirred by the heat of those bodies, the music quickens, grows wilder. The rhythm of the dance catches its frenzy. The dancers, gripping each other by the waist, build out of their bodies a wall that sways, tilts, rides and trembles in thrall to the music. As the fiddlers warm to their instruments, the melody twitches, spins loose, explodes into chaos. Sparks seem to fly as the lads scissor their legs, pounding the dust, leaping fearlessly through the air, shrieking with delight. And then suddenly everyone is swept up in a whirlwind, tearing the ground with sharp, swift kicks flying. The living wall sways right, sways left. The fiddlers mercilessly pinch at their strings, the sound sharpened and coarsened by their savage cries, 
mirroring each other, then swallowed back into the tide of rhythm. And now the circle, spinning and coiling tighter like a formidable snake, begins to shrink, collapse on, onto itself until it becomes a heap of burning flesh that rides fixed in the center for a moment, only to loosen all of a sudden, mollified, tamed, exposing the raw, scorching joy branded on the dancers' faces. But the musicians, vexed by this lull, must have their revenge, and their tune screeches out harder, deeper, more insistent. The ring of dancers, daring themselves to defy and smother the music's spell, charge at it, feet crushing into dirt, and the tornado of flesh twists into itself again, tighter, more stubborn, clenching and loosening, until finally the bodies melt into each other like a fallen harvest. There, fixed in that spot for a few minutes, for an eternity, possessed by the same maniacal rhythm, the bodies of men and women knead into each other, quivering, drumming. Once in a while, the simmering passion is pierced by long shrieks, erupting as if from ancient depths, or by the startled cry of a girl whose breasts were clenched too tightly. And that's how it would go on, until each dancer's soul melted into that all-encompassing flame of unbridled passion. But then, abruptly, like a chord sharply cut, the rhythm suddenly unravels and the young bodies splinter away with hoots of savage laughter and groans of pleasure satisfied, so that even the valleys seem to fill with trembling, as if the fury of human passion had unleashed the suppressed tremors of lust asleep in the earth. We are now moving to Canada, and um, I will uh, welcome Diana Manole, who is a Romanian-Canadian scholar and writer, whose translations have been published in Romania and abroad. Diana holds a doctorate from the University of Toronto, and she teaches literature, creative writing, and theater as well at universities in Canada. As I said before, it was a great joy for me to um, receive the award that she and Adam Sorkin received in, in 2018 uh, for their uh, translations of Emilian Galaico poem. But of course, uh, Diana has worked on several other wonderful translations. Uh, one of them, um, and this is my first question to you, Diana, I know you have translated Mihaela Dragan's play for the Roma Heroes Anthology. And I would like to ask you, what kind of an insight do you think this play offers uh, on the lives, in the lives of the Roma community? Thank you very much for having me and thank you very much for organizing this fascinating uh, panel. I am so delighted to listen uh, to everybody. Uh, yeah, I translated Mihaela Dragan's play and uh, I owe that to Adam. He first uh, recommended me to edit the translation and that was impossible. I had to retranslate it because this is a documentary drama. Mihaela, and uh, it was published, sorry, to, in Roma Heroes, as Gabriela said. And I think this is an amazing event. It was published by uh, Independent Theatre Hungary and U Women for the Future Association in uh, Budapest, Hungary. To my knowledge and to their knowledge, this is the first time ever when a collection of uh, Roma plays is being put together. So it's a, it's a historic, hi historical event, uh, really. And uh, Mihaela's uh, specific play is a documentary play. It is based on uh, uh, real life interviews. So she has talked to many Roma women in Romania. She also tells her own story. And she, it gives the range of the different kinds of life those uh, women have in Romania. It also gives uh, a glimpse into the kind of internal and external oppression and sexism and patriarchal values uh, they face in Romania. And uh, each of them, and this is one of the amazing things in Mihaela's plays, play, each of them talks in a specific way. When the play uh, arrived into my inbox, 
thanks to Adam's uh, uh, recommendation of me to the publisher, um, I was very disappointed to notice that it has been, it was translated into standard English, which means that it has lost exactly uh, the first, like Josefina said, it has lost the language's ability to portray each character, and it has lost the flavor, and it has lost the cultural specificity. So I couldn't uh, edit the play, I ended up retranslating the play. And one thing I am very happy, uh, I am very proud about is that I rejected the idea of using a well-known English sociolet or a, an English dialect or uh, of a specific uh, geographical uh, part of the world where people talk in English or to use the specific way of talking of, a, of another minority. I mean, I didn't want to translate the Romanian Roma women using the language of another oppressed minority somewhere else in the world. The difficulty was that I invented my own uh, kind of broken English with its own uh, uh, special mistakes and uh, you know uh, words, the unfinished words, and so on and so on, because I, I was hoping to give. Uh, the English readers and hopefully the English audiences one day uh, to give them a chance to really know this, this women. There are women, uh, they are women with very rich lives. lives uh, and uh, yeah, and I, I will give you an example. Uh, uh, I posted a recent question on Facebook. How do you translate to lie doamne? Hmm. Yeah. And I got some great answers on Facebook. Mm -hmm. Thank you. They, I, and they sent to me a second translation. And uh, it's the same story. Uh, it's translated into standard uh, in literary English. It doesn't even use contractions. Yeah, I'm happy. And I hope to uh, direct and produce this play one day in Toronto. I am also a theater director. Thank you. It's wonderful that you that you actually can do both uh, things, um, but you also translate poetry, and uh, you translated quite uh, recently, I, I believe, if I'm not wrong, uh, some poetry by Nora Yuga, who is one of uh, Romania's uh, foremost writers and uh, uh, a favorite of mine, I confess. Um, what can you tell us about uh, this translation? Thank you. I uh, started uh, translated uh, books. Uh, uh, I, I started translating in, into English with Adam Sorkin, and uh, I can vouch that he is a wonderful mentor, and uh, he's a wonderful friend. And uh, we translated together Hunchback's uh, Bus, uh, which was uh, long listed for a, a National Poetry Prize by Alta in the US. And then we translated the second collection, Dangerous Caprices, for which we are still looking for a publisher. And now I'm translating by myself. I've, I'm hoping I grew up and I am translating alone uh, Nora Yuga's uh, anthology, uh, The Heart with, uh, The Heart Like a Boxer's Fist. And, um, as probably most of you know, she is one of the most important, most productive and most interesting Romanian writers. She's going to turn 90 uh, this, uh, this January and she has just published a novel, a uh, hypodrome of over 400 pages. What fewer people know is that after her second book, the Circle's Captivity in 1970. The book itself was banned. It was uh, uh, the entire, all copies were destroyed. Uh, Nora Ayuga was banned for publishing for eight uh, years. And uh, after Ceausescu rose to power and we had those political thaw, she was finally unbanned. 
while she was banned, she wrote poems. She told me on the phone, uh, we've become long-term friends. Uh, uh, um, she wrote poems on paper napkins, usually at the Romanian uh, writer's restaurant in Bucharest, after many shots of vodka. And she stored them in a, in a drawer. And she never thought that she was going to publish them. After she was allowed to publish again, she was asked for a book. And she opened the drawer, found the, the, all those paper napkins, them together and she discovered that she had a book and she published this this uh, drawer book drawer book in both senses she, um, and uh, it was opinions about pain 1980 and it got her her first uh, uh, writer romanian writers union award which was at the time the most important uh, romanian literary award uh, I have started uh, with these poems from uh, her anthology, and uh, they are as challenging as anything else by Nora Yuga to translate. But they also, it was a, an emotionally charged uh, uh, translation process because I was kind of thrilled and overwhelmed by the fact that those poems have also in my view, historical importance. My feeling, in, if I may use a metaphor, was that I was literally holding the paper napkins from the 70s and translating. Uh, and I had to be careful to do them justice. It's a wonderful story, actually. And, uh, I really hope that this is what you have prepared to, to read to us today, some poetry. Uh, I did, I did. I hope I may, I am checking the time here. I would very much want to read uh, uh, two short poems, but if I may, I would like to read uh, the first one first uh, in Romanian. Oh, I want to mention, sorry, in a brief, uh, she's a surrealistic, uh, surrealist poet, and uh, it's not easy to publish poems by Nora Yuga uh, because, uh, well, last summer, my submission was rejected by the uh, volunteer readers at the Canadian magazine. And uh, this summer I was asked for a submission. I sent the same poems and the editor in chief loved them. And uh, uh, this next week probably, she's going to have eight uh, pages, six poems in a Canadian magazine. My point is sometimes it's too complex for the undergraduate students who are volunteer readers at magazines. Aș putea să mă întorc, nu mă amână nimic. Împrejur e un gard și în mijloc un greier. Să ciocnesc din când în când două rotițe de ceas. Ți-aș spune că a căzut o bilă câștigătoare în labirint. Și totuși, uneori, un copac seamănă cu o mână întinsă, așteptând ceva mai omenesc. Și este iar ieri, totul este ieri, de parcă am murit dinainte. In the labyrinth, I could come back. Nothing postpones me. There is a fence around me and a cricket in the middle, cogwheels grind sometimes. I'd like to tell you that the winning lottery ball dropped into the labyrinth. Maybe that's life. And yet sometimes a tree looks like an outstretched hand waiting for something more human. And it's yesterday, again, Everything is yesterday, as if I've died in advance. Can I read another very short one? Yes, please do. <coughs> Sorry, my voice left me suddenly. In a chalk pit, pit. If earth and flesh are meant to hurt, and like a wound, the soil 
opens when you bury the carcass of a dog whose nerve will stretch with a harp life like sound. It's my bone, the one talking alone in its sleep of strange convoys. It's my foretelling nail, cutting off the edges of a world along the veins of earth. A lizard passes and in a chalk pit, the song makes secret detours. Thank you very much. Thank you as well, Diana. Wonderful poetry. And we are now moving back to Romania. And uh, I would like to uh, introduce Philip O'Kelly now, uh, who is an author in his own right, whose short stories brought him the Rooney Prize for Irish Literature. His work has appeared in uh, prominent literary magazines and has been translated in 30 languages, if I'm not wrong. We met in 2016 in London where his translation of Mikhail Sebastian's For 2000 Years was launched at the RCI as part of Romania's participation at the London Book Fair. Um, Philip, it's nice to have you with us. And uh, I wanted to ask you because uh, our event uh, in 2016 was quite a successful one. And uh, it's not the event in itself, but the reception that uh, Sebastian's work had in the UK. Um, how do you, how can you comment on, on this amazing reception uh, that uh, his work had in yeah. the United Kingdom? Nice to see you again, Gabriela. Um, there's something about um, publishing is, is very unpredictable. Um, publishers themselves can't predict the effect uh, a book is going to have, the reception. I couldn't have uh, predicted the success that the book had either. Um, I, nobody asked me to publish it. I, I published, uh, I translated it back in, I think it was between 2006 and 2009, um, just because I liked it, and then had it for about for six years, where I was trying to interest the publisher. Um, I was sending it to small university publishers, um, odd sort of publishers that specialized in translation, like Doki Press, uh, Doki Archive Press. And no one was interested in it. And at that point in 2015, it was coming up to the time when um, the, the rights writes on Sebastian's work expired 70 years after his, his, his death. So at that point, there was, it wasn't necessary to negotiate with the estate. And I was thinking of just putting it on the internet just so that it would be available to scholars. Because um, Sebastian's diaries have been published in 2000. And it hadn't been a massive bestseller, but uh, it had been quite influential in that it had uh, quite an elite readership. I mean, people were interested in the interwar period, people were interested in the rise of fascism, had read it, you know, it already been written by um, the most important historians of that time, like. Tony Judd, uh, Timothy Snyder referred to Sebastian when talking about the, the rise of, of European fascism. And, uh, you know, a lot of writers had read it, but the book, it was a big book, so it didn't have a mass readership. So by the time uh, Penguin Modern Classics approached me, it was, I suppose, 2015, um, I, was, I was about to give it away for free. Uh, so it was a nice surprise. It, it ended well in that sense, and I that think was it was uh, it was pretty lucky in the sense that I hadn't been able to publish it before because at that point people had suddenly become very interested in the 1930s and the themes in for 2000 years. Um, you know, it was around the time of. So the time was published in 2016, then 
there was the Brexit issue and Trump was coming along and all the debate about how to deal with the, the influx of refugees. There were a lot of a lot of reasons why why people wanted to look at the lessons of the 1930s again, and all these things helped. I know you've worked on on other translations as well. Um, I don't want to to get into that too much because you're going to be part of another event uh, in the festival, so I don't want to just uh, spoil the surprise. Uh, but I do want to ask you. You are a writer as well, and I was wondering how does your translation and writing, creative writing practice, sit side by side by side? How do they get along? They get they get well. They get along fine. Uh, you know, I have uh, strengths and weaknesses as a translator. My weaknesses are not bilingual. I don't know Romanian perfectly. I I have to work very slowly and laboriously. And I don't take on very many projects. I'm only going to do something if I really have to spend time with it. Uh, my strength as a translator is that I, I think I, I can write well in English. And anything I do translate, I, I want to give it the kind of attention I give to, to my own work. And for 2000 years, I, I was able to do that. I, I didn't have to rush it. I didn't have any deadlines. Um, so I think I spent two or three years doing it in my spare time, and then again when I knew that we don't get a publisher, I was able to, you know, I was able to, but I wasn't a good translator, I, I wasn't experienced, and I had to actually, um, at that point, go from translating the, the sense to actually making the, something beautiful that would, that would be worth reading. Would you like to share a, a fragment from Sebastian's um, translation? I have, I have pages here that I'll, I'll read to you from uh, for 2,000 years. This was written in, in 1934. At the corner towards Boulevard Elisabetta was a group of boys selling newspapers crying death to the woods. I have no idea why I stopped and usually walk calmly by, because it's an old, almost familiar cry. This time I stopped in surprise, as if for the first time I had understand what, understood what these words actually meant. Strange, people are talking about death, about mine specifically, and I walk casually by from the direction in the half -year. I wonder why it's so easy to call for death or remain without anyone batting an eyelid. I think though the death is a matter dog or part. That's already a moment of silence. If somebody set themselves up in the middle of a street to demand, let's say, death to badgers, I think that would suffice to arouse some surprise in those passing by. Now that I think about it, the problem isn't that three boys can stand at a street corner and cry death, death in the woods, but that their cry goes unobserved and unopposed, like the tinkling of a bell on a track. Sometimes, sitting alone at home, I realize I can suddenly think of the clock. It's been beside me all along, but either because I wasn't paying attention or because I'm accustomed to I didn't notice it. It has got lost, along with many other familiar little noises, and a kind of silence that swallows the sounds of things around you. Out of this stillness, you get suddenly caught off guard by the clock ticking with unsuspected violence and energy. The strike in short pits like the blows of tiny metal faces. It's not a clock anymore, it's a machine drum. The sound covers everything, fills the room, grates on your nerves. I hide it in the wardrobe, the down even from there. I smother it beneath the pillow. The sound continues, distant, vehement. There's no cure but to design yourself. You have to wait. And after a while, by some miracle, the attack is over, the 
The cogs settle down, the second hand relaxes. You can no longer hear it. The ticking has blended back into the general silence of the house, merged with the general hum of all the other objects. Exactly the same thing happens with that age-old call for death, which is always present in our own Romanian streets, but is audible only at a certain moment. Year after year, it resounds in the ear of the common man, who is indifferent in a hurry with other things on tonight. Year after year, it rumbles and echoes in the street and byway, and nobody hears it. And one day, out of nowhere, behold how it suddenly pierces the wall of deafness around it and issues from every crack and from under every stone. It is extremely difficult to follow the progressive hardening of enmity from one day to the next. Suddenly you find yourself surrounded on all sides and have no idea how or when it happened. Scattered minor occurrences, gestures of no great account, the making of little threats, an argument in a tram today, a newspaper article tomorrow, broken window after that. These things seem random, unconnected to us. Then, one fine morning, unable to breathe. And Mihail Sebastian in 1934. And I think that's one of the things that attracted me to the book. That was, that was a couple of pages towards the end, is this sense of um, uh, imminent disaster, you know, that he's actually foreseeing what is his coming and is powerless to do anything about it except express it, except express his, uh, his feeling about what's happening in, in his world as, as clearly as he possibly can. Yeah. That was that was very powerful. Thank you very much, Philip. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I will continue with uh, our last guest for tonight um, in Romania as well, but a bit farther away from, from Bucharest in Cluj, Andrea Scridon. Uh, Andrea is a Romanian-American writer and translator who studied comparative literature at King's College London and creative writing at the University of Oxford. She also works as an editor for Asymptote Journal, the Oxford Review of Books and E-Ratio Poetry, and she is also a very active team member of our Romania Rocks Festival. Welcome, Andrea. Good to see you. It's ironic a little bit because we are both in Cluj uh, and we are still on Zoom together. I have one first question for you. You are both a writer and a translator. Do you feel that translating other people's works has impacted your work as a translator? as a writer? Um, thank you, Gabriela. To answer your question, definitely. Uh, I think this happens implicitly to any author who endeavors to translate um, other authors' writing. Uh, and you can look at, at authors like Seamus Heaney or Robert Lowell, who produced very creative translations by sort of working very uh, boldly with the original texts and making their own interpretations. Uh, in my case, I would say that it's very much linked to my identity of a hybrid of two cultures. So I grew up in both Romania and America and it, for me, it's a way of reconciling, um, I guess, these two twin parts of myself and of defining myself, first of all. Mm -hmm. Um, I was very, um, very surprised, pleasantly surprised when I heard that uh, you are now focusing on, on a new translation uh, project, among others, of course, um, a collection of short stories by writer and political dissident Ion Desiderius Serbu. Uh, the, that, um, as far as I understand, will be published later this year. And I wanted to ask you what drew you to his work? So um, actually, it's an interesting story because he was my grandmother's high school teacher here in Cluj. Um, and 
she and her entire class of an all girls college were sort of in love with him at the time. He would sing for them and recite poetry for them. And he was also my great grandfather's student at the University of Cluj and he lived around the corner. So basically I, I knew him even though he is a niche writer for the reason that, um, that his work wasn't published during his lifetime because he lived from 1918 to 1989. So he died just before the revolution. He was hounded by the secret police all of his life. Um, and we've only just begun to discover him now, unfortunately. But even this uh, tragic life story is very apparent in his writing and makes it so magnetic because he doesn't write about his own experiences in a self-pitying way, but rather with an equidistant and even ironic tone often and even amusing, satirical. I look forward to, to the book, um, actually, to your translation. Um, what have you prepared as a, as a reading for today? Is it uh, a fragment from this book or something else? So it is a fragment from this book and a short poem as well by a different author. So if that's okay, if you're doing well with time. I'll sure, go. of course. Okay. Um, so this is from a story from the Serbu book called Two Refined Intellectuals. It's about two professors of philosophy who um, see, keep seeing each other in a public restroom and both of them think that the other is gay because at the time it was sort of shocking um, and then it, it becomes quite amusing because they both reveal to each other that the other thought that the other was sort of spying on him um, and it's, it's very amusing that these people who are supposedly so intellectual and uh, I guess enlightened would think in that way so it's a, a sort of satire on, um, I guess, human society. So this is how it begins. In this magnificent city of mine, Genopolis, all paradoxes are possible. There is no continuity or consequence in anything or in anybody at all. Now it's sunny, in 10 minutes time it will rain or snow. The trees are either green or blue, violet or infrared. It depends on the sky's mood, or the bird might hurt. Who knows? Even the ordinary residents were very surprising. I have seen young girls that grew old in a matter of days, renowned athletes who became into books, splendid women fading after an unsuccessful night of love. Here, in our town, nobody is shocked if a, if a savant elopes with a barely literate youth, if a cashier embezzles just for the sake of it, or if our venerable judge is caught in the public park with a milkmaid, right under the bronze statue of the gallant philosopher Napokos. Because in our town, as I said, everything is possible, even the contrary of this possible. Just the other day, for instance, as I was on my way to the university, I respectfully bowed to a nobody. That evening, coming back, I couldn't greet him anymore. He'd become, over the course of one day, the most miserable, detestable toad eater. This is the situation on Argenopolis. It's been this way forever, and I don't think it would be in vain to hope for any change. For what purpose? Whom would it benefit? Of course, personally, I am spared these pathetic mutations as an associate professor of philosophy. Looking through my translations, I came across this poem, which I felt would be very appropriate to read today. Uh, it's called The Past. It's a poem by um, a Romanian poet and translator who is a pediatrician by day and translator Michelangelo and Shakespeare by night. He is Elitin and it is dedicated to a woman named Gabriela. So I thought that given that Gabriela is staring at it, then I would read it. The Past. The past is built upon through what it's and what it's doing. It vibrates with me as from fountains water springs and rises inversely through what it digs so that it's walling in under volution is an eternal diminution into diminution, always vaster, ever a complete state, binding me through what it liberates. I feel my past a desert doom shifting under a changeful dream, after a step always taking another fate and keeping its essential trace. Always it's off in obvious guise, and what I expect to hear laughing cries. 
but the past too has its own calling, craving like any night morning. Thank you so much, Andrea. It was absolutely beautiful. And thank you to Adam, Josefina, Gabi, uh, Diana, uh, Lydia, um, Philip, everybody who joined us today. Duncan as well, thank you very much for being with us uh, today. Uh, so it's, it's been an amazing uh, get together. I'm really happy to have seen all of you, even though uh, only via Zoom. And thank you very much to everyone who watched us today. Unfortunately, um, I think we are out of time. So we promise to answer any questions uh, after the event, but do stay tuned and keep on rocking. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for arranging this. And yes, been really good to listen to everyone. Thank you, thanks for having us. Thank, Thank you very much, all of Thank you. you. It's been an amazing, an amazing event. I hope I did not forget anyone now at the end because it was, uh, <laughs> it was a roller coaster. Thank you, Gabriela, and everybody yeah. else. Yeah, thanks. Everybody. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll keep in touch and uh, have a, a lovely day. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. 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 Bye.